So yes, I'm here to talk about level ed and um, there's kind of two aspects to my talk. One of them is that I've, um, I've taken quite a sort of circuitous route to becoming uh, an Erlang developer. So I'm going to tell you about something about that path and about the experience of, of writing my first project. Um, and the second thing is just about LevelEd itself, why I chose to write yet another Erlang key value store and, uh, and how that key value store has, um, has turned out. Hopefully that will come back again. So some history about how I got here. Um, back in 2004, I'd spent the sort of first 10 years of my career as a, a network engineer. And I was working at a network engineer at a company that suddenly won a very large project for the National Health Service in England uh, to build a new um, national messaging and database um, solution. Um, so um, I was the network guy on that project and uh, the contract award was made in December, two uh, December 2003 and in the summer of 2004 we went live and as you can imagine uh, with a very large distributed system all written in sort of uh, enterprise Java stuff with Oracle and lots of Sun tin lying around the place. Uh, um, there were a few problems um, with that having gone live just seven months after contract award. And one of the unfortunate things is that because uh, every sort of aspect of the application relied on communication between multiple servers, every problem looked like a network problem. So me, the network guy, got involved in every problem. And I soon decided that I'd rather spend more time uh, sorting out these application things than uh, being blamed for the network going down every time the application didn't work. So um, I, I decided that uh, I was going to spend some more time in application. I learned a lot about applications on that. Um, but then on that project in early 2005, some new management came in. They decided they could fix all the problems in the project by adding more process, more managers, and more dishonesty. And, and at that point, I thought I'd rather go and work on something else. Uh, um, so I left and sort of wandered around for a while. And um, during that wondering, though, I, I kept thinking about my time on the project and thinking that surely there's a better way of doing things. And, and I read various stuff uh, uh, about different approaches to projects. And I also stumbled across some new databases that were written in Erlang. And I was asked, thinking about how we did high availability systems and stumbled across the history of Erlang in the telecom sector. Uh, and that had sort of quite an impact on me. And so by 2011, I was now working for the health service itself. And uh, the contract was coming up for a new for, uh, for the original uh, project. So they were looking to uh, uh, procure a replacement. And um, so had the changes of the previous management had an effect? Well, they had of sorts. I mean, it, it was pretty much highly available. I mean, not entirely highly available, but pretty much highly available. Uh, um, they weren't meant to lose any data, and they hardly lost any data. So, so that wasn't too bad. Uh, um, but that high availability and protection from data loss uh, had come at a cost. The addition of all the process and all the management and uh, perhaps some of the dishonesty meant that there was now 3,000 servers required to support the system across all the environments. And the running costs so far had got to over a billion pounds. And uh, the supplier themselves was bragging in its case study that it had spent over 18,000 person years to get to that point. And, and so the, the question really that was going around the health service uh, organization at the time is, was, um, is this the cost of availability of doing large-scale systems uh, in this way? And surprisingly, a lot of people thought, well, yes, I mean, surely that's it. I mean, you know, if you're going to have all that process and all that management, that must be necessary. And if you don't have all that process and all that management, well, it'll be chaos, won't it? So, uh, um, so a lot of people thought that it was, and, and I kind of disagreed with them. And uh, uh, I, I kind of got on with building a replacement and eventually got permission for that replacement to happen. And so um, by 2014, we'd built a replacement for this solution uh, and uh, we went live. And in the uh, sort of nearly three years now since we've gone live, we've met that five nines availability target. But we've met it now efficiently. So we've met it without all the side effects that we had before. So we're now releasing once a week, not once every other year at 30 million pound transition costs. Um, where, um, um, and it took less than 100 people years to get to that point. We now have a fairly small team working on it. And 90% of that team's activity is spent on development time rather than operational time. 
And, and how did we get there? Well, you know, there were a lot of changes in our approach and uh, 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 not just technology changes and this kind of stuff. But there is, a, a, you know, an underlying theme in the solution that uh, the main products that we used are built on Erlang. And although the code that we've actually written, uh, most of it's written in Python, uh, um, it was written with... Uh, and some kind of Erlang architectural principles in place. So, you know, we still, generally speaking, all the code does message passing between processes and this kind of stuff. And our approach to uh, failure handling is very much uh, um, Erlang inspired. So, um, and so we've done a, a big change, and uh, we now had a, a much more efficient solution. And and that had, you know, sort of reaffirmed my faith that there was something to be learned um, from this uh, this uh, sort of strange esoteric technology and programming language called Erlang. Um, so I found myself sort of last year or so thinking, well, what should I do as my next challenge? Uh, and uh, I didn't really want to go and do another sort of uh, big project that required uh, other people and that kind of stuff. I'd quite like working on my own for a bit. So I decided to challenge myself and said, well, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about uh, why I think the ideas in Erlang are a good idea and that kind of stuff. But I've never myself developed something in Erlang. Uh, um, I don't, I, as, as mentioned before, I don't have a traditional development background. I've mainly been a network engineer all my career. So I thought, well, you know, let's give it a go. Let's try and develop something in Erlang. And you know, what do you develop if you're going to develop something in Erlang? Well, everyone has to have a go at a key value store at some stage, I guess. So I thought, well, I'll write an Erlang key value store. And, and you know, the reasons for, uh, for, for going for a key value store were, in part, um, you know, the main Erlang product that I'd got used to at this stage was React, and we've had a tremendously positive experience from React KV uh, um, in the in the National Health Service on the Spine project. Uh, most of our, uh, the majority of our nodes are React nodes, and it's done a great job for us in terms of providing the durability and availability we need without any operational overheads. Um, so, but having used React for a while, I'd got a bit used to the code base and this kind of stuff. So I felt, well, that's some that's an area where I can actually, uh, you know. Uh, I understand well and I can do something with. And, and Erlang has this concept of pluggable backends. And so I thought, well, you know, why don't we have a go at pluggable uh, doing one of those backends? And of those backends, uh, um, one of them is, is written in Erlang, which is Bitcast, but still requires a lot of C, P, a lot of C code that's sniffed out for a lot of the core bits, and it's not fully featured. And the only fully featured one is, is, is Level DB, and, and that's written in C++, and has become an increasingly complicated piece of code. Uh, um, originally, um, Level DB from you know from Google was designed to run on mobile phones, and and obviously running it uh, multiple nodes on a single on servers clustered uh, through React. It's a very different type environment. So. Uh, uh, um, MVM at uh, Basho, who's done most of the work in this, has done an incredible amount of effort to uh, extend and improve Level DB for using in in React. But there was a bit of me that thought, well, uh, rather than you know um, uh, uh, putting all that effort. Um, changing level DB. What if we started with similar principles of level DB, uh, um, but try to think from the start about something that was better suited to React? So I'm not trying to write a generic key value store, but what if I'm just trying to write one specifically for the purpose of React? So I, I started with the concept of the log structured merge tree. So um, level DB is based on this idea called log structured merge trees, which comes from a paper from about 25 years ago, I think. And the log structured merge tree paper um, looked at the hardware economics at the time. So looked at the cost of memory, the cost of disk space, the cost of random and uh, uh, read and writes to disk, and the cost of bulk read and writes to disk. And said, so based on these costs, this is probably how we should be structuring our stores. Yeah, and the idea is is that um, we want to uh, uh, we want to have all our information sorted on disk so it's fast to find, um, but random writes are expensive, so we don't want to write them into that sorted place. So how do we make that compromise? Well, in the log structured merge tree, is when we receive stuff, we we store it first in a very small tree, that C0 tree, and in that tree, it may not even be ordered uh, uh, um, by key, it may be ordered by sequence which was received, so it can be append only when we write it. And we'll store in memory uh, um, th um, that information where it's cheaper to organize, we can store it in, uh, um, in key order there. 
And when and but memory is expensive, so w when memory gets full, uh, we need to merge that down. But we so we but when we merge that down to another level to another file and clear that out, so we can accept new writes in. And when we merge that down, we'll be writing it sorted, but we'll be writing it in bulk sorted. And because bulk writes are cheaper than random writes, that would be better. Um, but we don't want to write too much in bulk, so we'll make sure the next level down's bigger than the previous level, but not that much bigger. Yeah, and, and when that level gets full, then we'll need to write down to the next level, and the next level will need to be bigger, and this kind of stuff. And that forms the basis of a, of a log structure merge tree. Um, and so, based on our experience of running level DB and level DB's log structured merge tree, what would we change in terms of principles to get something that's more fundamentally suited to React? Well, the first thing that we find when we run React in a production environment is that um, the React database, the bottleneck is almost always disk I/O. So um, you know, uh, and and disk I/O is a kind of it's a kind of a hard, unpredictable bottleneck to deal with. It tends not to behave in a stable way as you start hitting limits, and and it's very hard to make it make it smooth and that kind of stuff. So we want to reduce the disk I/O. And what's the big driver of disk I/O? So although we're doing uh, uh, with through log structure mercury, we made things more efficient. By uh, by batching up these writes, still that write activity is a dominant factor, and well, the reason why it's a dominant factor is that every time in level DB, when we're when we're in that merge tree, we've sorted the keys and values in order. So when we rewrite the keys that th that tree down to the next level, we're rewriting keys and values. So the volume of writes that we're doing is proportional to the size of our values. Yeah, and if we've got larger values. Then uh, um, that's going to be a dominant factor, and um, other people have been thinking about this as well. So there's a couple of other um, um, alternative log structure merge trees that are out there at the moment. Uh, one of them, WISKEY, which came out of the University of Wisconsin, and the other one, which is Badger, which is a, a, a key value store written in Go by the DGraph people, and, and they've both followed the same principle, which is to say. Uh, um, right amplification is a problem, so we'll actually put our values to one side and we'll only merge down keys and references to where the values are in the merge tree and we'll get rid of that right amplification uh, that way. And there's nothing new about that idea because it was actually in the LSM tree paper in, in, in the first place. It said, maybe you should do this, maybe you shouldn't. I'm not making that decision for you. And, and now increasingly people are looking at that. So we're going to split values out at the start and not put that into the merge tree. The other thing for those who are familiar with the React database is that when it writes something to React, you're actually going to write it to three different stores on three different nodes. And when you're going to read that, you're going to read it from three different stores. You're going to deal with probably the first two responses. And you're going to try and work out from the vector clock information uh, which one is a valid response to send back. But in order to do that, because it's, it's used to using generic key value stores that support only GET requests, it gets the free objects from all gets the object from all free stores. So it's performing that get three times and sending it three times over the network. But for, for two of those objects, it's going to ignore the value and it's really only interested in the vector clock. So if we have a key value store that supported a head request, so a request that only returned the key in the metadata, then potentially we could run React in a more efficient way. So that's the second part of the efficient hypothesis. Can we support head requests? And then the other thing is increasingly in React, we're looking at other data objects and data types, and they may need to be handled differently within the data store, so merged in a different way and that kind of stuff. When we look at different types of CRDTs, like big sets and this kind of stuff, and, gen and generic key value stores don't really have uh, any, any concept that can help with that. So we want to have a value store where we can attach a tag to our keys and then attribute different behavior in the store depending on that tag. So they were the sort of three founding ideas that of why there might be a good reason to write a different key value store. And so that's what I started with. Um, so if we look at how level DB works in my scruffy drawing, uh, um, in effect, at the start, a put is going to go into the underscore mem in memory table, which is just a skip list, uh, um, uh, which gives you a sorted view of the current, of the most recently received keys. And the key and the value is written to a, a log below, which is a ordered by sequence which they find, uh, which, they, they, which they were received. Uh, and then when that in memory store is full, 
it's uh, pushed to one side and made immutable, and a new story started. But now that log, that nursery log, is a candidate to be merged down into the tree, and then they all ripple down with those keys and values. So uh, um, level ed is, 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 is fairly simple. Um, but now, to a certain extent, I've drawn some top hats on there, which is representing our actors in our level ed store. So uh, when we get the put, that goes to this uh, top hat character called the bookie. He's going to receive it. And the bookie wants the key and value permanently written, because it's got to be a reliable store. So we still want to have that nursery log. So he passes it to a character called the inker over on the far side. And the inker is going to write it into its a journal, which is the equivalent of the nursery log. Uh, um, and when it's written it into there, the inker can tell the bookie this is the sequence number of that write. Um, the bookie then takes out the metadata from the value. It's got the key, it's got the metadata and the sequence number, and it's now going to write that into its merge tree. But rather than write di direct into it directly, it puts in its own sorted memory view. It doesn't need a persisted view of that because the inker has already got a persisted view. Yeah, and it can now acknowledge the put. Uh, um, and then um, once that in memory thing gets full, it gets pushed down to the penciler, and the penciler is our actor who's responsible for keeping the merge tree. And the merge tree, as I say, just contains keys, metadata, and sequence numbers. So if we want to do a get in the future, the get will go to the bookie. The bookie needs to look in the merge tree first, so it will look in its in-memory cache first for that key. If it finds it there, it's got the sequence number, if it doesn't, it goes down to the penciler, and the penciler looks down its, uh, its stack of the previous caches and then the persisted view of that merge tree. And eventually, it will find the key we're looking for, and that will give it the key, the metadata, and the sequence number. And with the key and the sequence number, it will go to the inker, and it will say, use that key and the sequence number to fetch the value. Okay. And whereas the nursery log previously was uh, removed after a while in level, uh, in, in level DB, in level ed, the journal is now a perpetual journal. Uh, we cut new files every sort of uh, um, 500 megabytes, and we keep a manifest of which sequence numbers are in which files. So with that manifest, I can actually go to the file and extract uh, um, the value from there and return that to the customer. Uh, um, if the client had just done a head request, I can do just the same thing, only now I don't need to fetch the value from the inker, so the head requests are now more efficient. And because this merge tree is much smaller, because it only contains keys and metadata, it's much more likely to be covered in the page cache, and that's much more likely to be an in-memory lookup. So it means I can get very consistent, fast response times to head requests, and slightly slower response times to get requests. So um, so we support these uh, basic operations. Put puts it into the journal. Uh, bookie caches the change. Get, I've been through there. Head is, is faster than a get. We also want to be able to support indexes. So when we put an object, that object may come up, we may have some index changes. So we write the object into the journal, so we got it as a permanent record. But then when we write the changes into the merge tree, we don't just write the key and the metadata and the sequence number of the primary object. We also write additional keys for any indexes that have been added so that we can query those indexes uh, um, in the future. To do efficient fold, uh, um, well, the ledger's entirely in key order, so we can fold over their uh, those indexes. And we can also fold over the keys in an efficient way if we're interested in just the keys or the keys and the metadata. We can't fold over the keys and the objects in an efficient, in an efficient way, but we can fold over the keys and the metadata. But to support folds, obviously we don't want to block up the penciler or the bookie or the inker whilst we're doing those folds. So we need to be able to clone the store. So we need to be able to do snapshots. And it's interesting, in, in I think in Badger, the Govase version, they said, well, we're not doing snapshots. That's too complicated. Uh, but in, in Erlang, that's actually really easy because um, the penciler and the inker both have a manifest of all the, of, of, of all the files. And ev for every file, we start a new process. So that manifest is actually mapping, in the case of the Inca, from sequence numbers to the process IDs of the finite state machines that sat in front of those files. So if I want to clone the database, I just start a new Inca or start a new penciler, and I hand it the manifest, and that can talk to those FSMs directly. Okay, So cloning is very easy to do, and the only thing I need to do, I need to keep a register 
of what uh, what manifest sequence numbers the clones were taken uh, um, f by snapshot, so that if any f if any finite state machine decides it wants to die because it's been finished with, it, it knows it gets informed to hold on until that snapshot's expired. So we can do clones in a very simple way. And then um, when we come to the to the React world, uh, um, you know, React is you know we end up with many physical nodes down the side there, and V nodes running on those nodes. Uh, and and now when we want to do a get, is um, we have um, in the old world we've got a finite state machine get started somewhere in the cluster, and it goes and calls for three gets. Those three gets have to lift all three values off the disk, uh, wher wherever they are, and then they have to return them back. And commonly, they return them back at the same time to the calling FSM, and that can cause some interesting problems on your network when sort of uh, um, three gigabit connections go into one at the same time, and there's a problem called TCP incast that's caused by that. So, uh, um, and ultimately, one of those is probably going to get discarded. Two of those are going to get looked at, and, and in most circumstances, only one of them will be chosen. So instead, what we do now is we do three head requests. When we've got two of those head requests from back, we can work out if we can actually satisfy the uh, answer by just asking for one get request, because if those, particularly if those two head requests uh, reveal they've got the same vector clock or one dominates the other. And now we only do one get request to fulfill that. So we don't have that race condition of three re responding at the same time across the network and sending a large object. And the same thing, when it comes to fetching the values, only one uh, of the stores is doing the values. So as values get larger, then uh, we do less and less disk I.O. activity to, su to support those gets. Uh, it means that we have a slightly higher median latency for gets because we have to do a head and then we do a get after. So, you know, level DB with React is faster in terms of median latency for gets, uh, um, but uh, um, level ed ends up with some interesting characteristics. So, where have we got to uh, with uh, level ed? So, it, it's still, uh, uh, to a certain extent, a, a work in progress. Um, it's largely a functionally complete backend for, for, for React now. Um, there's some extra testing that I need to do um, around the uh, um, uh, object expiry logic, because uh, um, I think there's still some things that are unsolved in React about how to correctly do object ex expiry. I've done some initial integration testing with React. Um, and but I've focused on doing um, uh, some some volume tests really to compare what happens with React and Level Ed versus React Level DB, because um, uh, um, although it's not necessary for uh, um, I, I didn't think it was necessary for Level Ed to outperform Level DB. Uh, you know, clearly if we write something purely in Erlang. Our expectation is when we go then go and compare it against something written in C++ or C, when it's mainly doing low-level I.O. type activity and mutating stuff in memory, that we may be outperformed significantly. So I wanted to make sure that we had some kind of parity uh, uh, with, with level DB. And, and as a project in terms of test, we've sort of at about the sort of 99% sort of test coverage around CT and E-unit tests. But the main things we want to focus on now is property-based testing. So uh, uh, Russell Brown has helped with some initial um, property-based testing, and hopefully we'll be expanding that out going forward. So, um, so doing volume tests. So we know the primary advantage of level ed is that it should reduce the activity on disk. Okay. And so the first thing I tested it with is uh, you can have various different configurations with React. And one of the configurations you can have is have sync enabled, which basically says every time you append a new write to the end of a nursery log or a transaction log or whatever your backend stores, make sure you flush that to disk. Now, we do that in the NHS because, you know, data loss is a real big headache for us and it's something that we don't ever want to have. So we flush that to disk every time uh, and uh, you know we're helped by the fact we have uh, flashback write caches in our servers uh, um, to, to, to assist with that. So the first testing I did was with solid state drives and with sync enabled. 
Now, in that environment, uh, uh, we got a significant throughput advantage with level ed over level DB. So that's running React-based tests, so not necessarily testing uh, level ed just as a uh, just a back end, testing it via React with all the other optimizations for level ed built into React. Um, but that shouldn't be surprising because the one thing that flushing to disk is going to do is going to hurt your uh, capacity to do disk I/O. Um, similarly, without flushing to disk and, and testing it on, uh, on traditional hard disk drives, spinning disk, we saw a big performance advantage with React and Level Ed as well on there. But, you know, hard disk drives are slow, so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that. So I've focused since on doing different tests without sync being enabled and on solid state drives to try and see, well, what's the difference there? Because that should be uh, um, a better environment for, for level DB. And perhaps going forward be a, will be a more common environment for uh, users of React. Um, and I've focused on um, situations where the value is more than four kilobytes. So in the NHS, our average value size for our different clusters tends to vary between about eight kilobytes and about 100 kilobytes. Uh, um, and, um, you know, I think if we go below four kilobytes, there's unlikely to be any advantage of separating out the value in the key value store because once you've gone down the merge tree to read the key, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of a block size away, so you may as well have just read the value. So I've been focused on stuff more than four kilobytes, so all the testing I've been doing has been on uh, eight kilobyte object sizes as kind of the first multiple beyond that. Uh, and, the OFC. And, no, and when we do volume tests, we tend to get these types of shapes. So this is a volume test that did a series of gets, uh, I think it was five gets for every put, and then also ran a load of 2i queries in parallel. So the top line, the green line, is the throughput that we were achieving during the test. So with the far side being React combined with level ed, and the near side being React combined with level, DB, level DB. And what you can see is that there are definitely times when the, the kind of overall throughput is better in level DB than with level ed, but we consistently get a, a more regular performance with, with level ed. So, um, you know, these intervals, I think, are every, every 20 seconds. So from one 20-second period to another with React and level DB, we're getting fairly significant variance in, in performance, whereas with React and level ed, we're getting very consistent performance. And over the course of the test, what we generally find as we get towards the towards the end of the test, we get towards like I think this one was a six hour test. So in the fifth and sixth hour of those tests, as we've now got a populated database and that kind of thing, as we've grown beyond the size of the page cache, is we being we, we, we tend to see uh, uh, an overall throughput improvement in React Level Ed of between 20% and 50% compared to React and Level DB. So given that we've sort of introduced an inefficiency of using Erlang, uh, um, the fact that we've actually gained a throughput advantage is, is quite nice to see. And the, the bottom two lines are the effectively the uh, tail latencies. So uh, um, the bottom line being the maximum latency and the line above being the 99th percentile. And you know, the reason for that volati volatility and throughput is really down to the to the big increases in tail latency that we see on React and Level DB, uh, whereas React and Level Ed has much more stable uh, uh, um, um, tail latencies. So, um, although it started as a kind of personal challenge, uh, uh, um, um, you know, I think the results that we've seen are, are genuinely interesting and perhaps an indication that there's there's some value in in, in pursuing it as a, as as a store. Um, so, so this is kind of my first uh, um, major Erlang project. So, what did I find hard? Uh, well, um, yeah, picking data structures I found hard. Uh, you know, because obviously, you know, as soon as possible in the database, I want to make things immutable, and then it plays nicely with Erlang. But but at sometimes they have to be mutable, and uh, and yeah, I just made loads of silly mistakes there, and and used the wrong data structures, and uh, so uh, I've I've slowly enhanced and improved that over time. 
there's a mis misfortune that anyone that works with React has to deal with is that React still uh, only supports OTP 16. So uh, originally I wrote level ed for OTP 18 and I've now had to make it backwards compatible with 18 and 16. And I found that whole backwards compatibility thing fairly hard to deal with. And I think, you know, it's now holding me back from moving on to OTP 19 because I think that's going to make life uh, um, even harder. Um, the the hard problem that I've kind of didn't really explain what what happens is that we the Incas keeping this journal this this long history of keys and values, but sometimes we update our values and sometimes we delete them. Yeah, so that that bit in history that previous transaction record is now garbage. So so how do we clean that garbage up? And so to to clean the garbage up, effect, uh, um, to clean the garbage up is that we have a background compaction process that occasionally kicks in, picks a random set of keys and sequence numbers from, from each of the journal files, uh, a, a sample from them, and then goes, takes a snapshot of the penciler, which has got control of the merge tree, and asks the question, are these sequence numbers the latest ones? And based on the answers it got, it can make a decision about what, am what amount of space should be reclaimable from that journal, and uh, once it's made that decision, it can then decide, well, that journal, I can clean up 40% 40 40 of the space from it. So uh, um, it goes, well, that's worth compacting. So it then s rolls over the journal, asking for each key, whether it's the most recent sequence number, and uh, writes a new journal, and then uh, removes the old one. Uh, but that was uh, sort of relatively tricky to do. And it's one of the reasons why um, I pass sequence numbers over to the merge tree uh, rather than just passing over references to which journal, uh, you know, pointers to the journal and the offset where the actual value resides. Because if I was to use those offsets, the coordination involving in compacting the journal would get too hard. And um, it, I, I don't know how WizKey uh, um, and, and other uh, uh, stores actually manage that because they, they don't explain it in the paper. Um, um, vnode coordination issues. Um, one of the things, if 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 you're writing a backend for for React, typically you've got a dozen backends starting up on one node, and they all start up at the same time. So you know, with hindsight, it's fairly obvious if you set a consistent buffer size, they'll all do their first write to file at the same time, and, uh, and you'll end up with very jerky performance and that kind of stuff. So there's a need for a certain amount of randomization to make sure that VNOs don't end up coordinating and synchronizing, and, uh, um, and, s and that same thing with doing compaction work and other such stuff. Um, um, long tail blocking is that uh, ultimately, the bookie is a single act of a single queue at the front of the store at the moment. Uh, I haven't thought about multi-threading it other than the ability to clone it for long-running queries. Uh, the reason why it, uh, it's not been multi-threaded is, is that it's designed for React, where in, in essence we've already got multiple stores per node, so that's what's providing sort of uh, um, concurrency there. So I didn't feel there was a sort of a need to allow sort of uh, uh, you know concurrent updates to an individual store. So, um, um, but you know, we've got to make sure that that those actors aren't blocked. And I did silly things like you know calling CAS and going, well, wow, it took 40 milliseconds to get a response from the CAS. Why is that? Well, you know, you passed a massive, you know, uh, 4,000 item list. What do you expect, sort of thing? So, uh, I, 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 I kept blocking it accidentally with doing silly things. Okay. And then finally, uh, um, naming things. I'm, I'm useless at naming things, so I regret every name I've given every part of the service, including the name of the, name of the database itself. Um, so was it worth it? I'm glad I've done it. Uh, I've, I've learned loads about Erlang. So, you know, for me, not being a developer by training, being a network engineer, uh, um, you know, it's it was kind of frightening getting into the idea of of of, of writing a big program like this, uh, and in particular writing in something in a language which sort of other people were saying, well, that's that's hard. And 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 to be honest, I didn't really find it uh, anywhere near as as hard to get used to Erlang as I expected. 
the the axe model really worked for it for me you know in my head it made it much easier to think about how the system would work i don't know how people understand objects that makes no sense to me whatsoever so so perhaps there's just something odd about me uh, um I've been, I say, really pleasantly surprised by the throughput comparison. Uh, um, the fact that actually, without doing any special stuff, we've managed to get uh, um, Erlang to perform. And I did, yeah, you at know, one stage, you know, say I've got to do NIFs here, and that's and spent a load of effort doing um, file I/O NIFs and this kind of stuff, and then found it didn't make that much difference, and uh, you know, added a lot of complexity. So it is still a pure Erlang system at the moment. Um, obviously, for those of us that use React at the moment. We're currently facing some uh, um, um, interesting challenges with the future of supporting React as uh, there may be no more Basho going forward. Uh, and so and that's in some ways is increasing the relevance of having uh, the potential of a pure Erlang backend store because it means that you know in order to support React going forward, if we have a pure Erlang store, we only need to understand Erlang. We don't need to switch between understanding Erlang and then understanding some relatively complicated uh, C++ code. So we are now um, um, thinking of progressing and doing some pre-production testing on the Spine project at the NHS. Uh, and so I can't say that it will ever make it into production, but it's now something that we're seriously thinking about as, as potential as a, a, a production back end. So that is me. Uh, um, you can find Level Ed on GitHub, uh, and you can find me on uh, Twitter. So thank you very much. Um, so the, the question is, did, have I tried using it to replace other React stores like the core metadata? And, and, and no, I haven't thought about that yet. Um, React also uses LevelDB in its active anti-entropy store. Uh, um, and, and that's something that I'm actually looking at at the moment. So I'm looking at how active anti-entropy works and trying to think is, uh, um, you know, should we carry on using LevelDB for that? Would level ed be better? Or maybe does that really need to be in that type of merge tree type store? Is it suited to that? Um, so, uh, but I've never, I haven't thought about the core metadata at all. And, and uh, so. Okay, so yeah, if you if you speak to you after us, then that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so um, memory management, I, I decided that I, I was too stupid to do memory management, but uh, um, but the page cache is my friend. So um, if we go back to um, the picture um, I had here. So um, the, the only stuff we keep formally in memory, so you make a conscious decision to keep in memory, is the bookies um, current cache of the most recent keys and metadata, which is only about sort of 2,000, 3,000 keys of metadata. And then the Penciler's stack of that cache, which is about 32,000 keys and metadata. So it's not a huge amount of memory. And then uh, um, at that point, once we get to 32,000 keys, it gets written to a file. And all of those things are written to file, and we don't do any caching of it whatsoever. We rely entirely on the page cache. So I do some F advise stuff. So we F advise so that we prefer to cache the stuff in the in the uh, in the pencilers merge tree in the ledger uh, and uh, in the um, over in the journal which is the transaction log of all the keys and the objects and they're actually uh, using DJ Bernstein's constant database format uh, and and that has a lookup tree at the end so we f advise a lookup tree and don't f advise anything else and then we just leave it up to the page cache to decide what should be in there and what shouldn't <coughs> 